to go through the employee development or the competency development and kind of where we're at with it, where it's, it's still going, some things we're still working through, and then I know a lot of y'all are kind of asking the question of where does that play into the staff development and some, some of the positions, so that'll kind of be what we're going to finish up with. <laughs> so I guess the first part that we start with, anytime we talk about you know what we're doing to develop our employees and all of that, we always start with the vision because that's eventually where we want to go. There's no set timeline on when we're going to get there, but obviously we want to become the standard to, you know, for operational excellence and customer service to which everybody's measured. So that's kind of how we're always going to start with employee development. So I guess when you think about what competencies or why competencies when you're talking about it, the first is to be able to measure your workforce. So anytime you're trying to set a standard, you got to be able to have some kind of descriptor to be able to measure it. So by developing the statistics behind it, then we'll be able to see where our workforce is really strong as opposed to where they're really weak. So by doing that, then you can start tailoring what your your safety alerts need to look like, what your safety focuses need to look like. So kind of the, the rule of that is if you get a lot of questions and you're getting a lot of, let's say, B operators or A operators and they're missing a lot of questions about compressors, we probably need to bring a guy in that needs to talk about Walkershaws or CATs or white superiors and stuff like that. So that's where we get into that. <clears throat> so the next one's the candidate and placement uh, selection. So the more that we can get in by screening our, our candidates when they come in the door, the better we're able to tell where they, they need to be and, and, and then help out our, our customers throughout the uh, selection process. So the legality concerns with our industry. So you'll hear me say it pretty often that the, the more and more everybody notices that our industry is getting a lot more litigious. So it's only a matter of time until Danoff or somebody, one of our competitors is in a court of law having to explain that the A operator we sent to the customer is actually an A operator. So how do you prove that? Well, you do it with competency models to where you can actually say this is where the, this is his knowledge from here to here. The other part to the competency of that one of the legality concerns is we're forced with a lot of our customers where they start up and you know the guy's working at McDonald's and then all of a sudden he's working offshore because his uncle is you know you know higher up and then six months later they say well now he's an A operator. Well, we probably don't feel comfortable with him in that position, but a lot of times we're kind of you know forced to maybe move the guy ahead. So we want to have something in place to where if we need to maybe you know. We can say, hey, we don't feel comfortable yet. Here's where he, he's measuring up with aptitude and physically, but you know, if you want to move him up, that's okay. So then the, the, the last part is linking the permitting and planning directly to the execution of the work as well as safe and efficient operations. So you hear me say it pretty often. I, I kind of steal Ben Franklin's slogan that uh, failure to planning is planning for failure. So that's exactly where this comes in. We always want to make sure that the, uh, they understand where the JSA process works and how that ties into executing your work safely and efficiently. So we're seeing kind of a rash of injuries right now. And I always relate that to auditing JSAs because if <coughs> that's the, the, the last administrative tool you get to before you end up getting into the work. So that's the last place you get to identify it. So if you're not properly planning it out and you're not properly filling these things out correctly, then you're kind of opening the door for incidents. starting the, the kind of the, the storyboard of how this looks when we start off you know the first portion or the first two bullets that's kind of really where the recruiters are tying in so the first part that when we bring a new hire on board no matter what position he's in but I always talk about operators because that's that's the world I come from so when you're talking about screening for the compatibility of them so the first thing the recruiters are doing is they're making sure that they have the right cultures and values to be a part of Danos. So, you know, the, are, they, are we comfortable with saying that, yeah, we want this person representing us? So when they get done and, and we feel that they're at that level, we're, we're actually screening for the knowledge and the functional technical skills. So that's where they're doing KSAs and making sure that they're setting the baseline for the guy. So it'll be, you know, if, if the guy's an A operator, everybody's got a great looking resume, this is kind of how we're gonna measure it to make sure that pen to paper, that's what he's actually saying. So then we go into the, well, I'm sorry, so the, the technical screening is actually where the, uh, the recruiter is actually 
uh, taking a screening process that Mark and a few of the other production specialists developed to make sure that, yeah, the guy's not just wasting our time, so now we can put him into actually taking the test and moving forward. That's when you get into the, the KSA portion. And then finally, the, uh, the candidate interviewed by an operation specialist for skill verification. So once everything's said and done, the guy took the test, he still gets it and stuff. People, a lot of times people are real good at test taking, but that doesn't necessarily mean they really understand it. So we wanna make sure that we're getting them in front of you know, a production specialist. And then when you're dealing with the other service lines, you know, if the guy's you know, a coding guy or a construction or fab, we want him talking to one of these technical experts or you know, an SME to make sure that he's not just really good at test taking, he actually knows what he's talking about. When you start running them through scenario-based questions and case study and stuff like that. <laughs> So again, the KSA test I was talking about, it. so we still do them annually. A, a lot of people ask, well, <coughs> if it's just a baseline test, why are you doing it? One, you wanna measure your baseline every year to be able to see the progression. The other part to it is a lot of our customers require it. So it's an ISA net world requirement. If y'all aren't familiar with it, IS net world is a, an employee verification process and certain things have to be in there for people to go on the job site. KSAs are a requirement for just about every customer that's in there and then there's certain thresholds, I think the parameter is like 80% you have to score above to be in there. So we're always gonna give KSAs annually regardless of, of the way that our model is, is working. So the next one, this is kind of what, we, this is what we've been developing throughout the year. So 2018 was kind of the R&D year to be able to wrap our arms around what training looked like, what competency looked like, and how it all tied together. So if you can imagine, this is kind of like a five-year plan. If you take a guy that's coming off the streets and he doesn't know what Teflon tape and never sees is, all the way to becoming you know, a lead operator. Now, that's not how it's always gonna work. You're not gonna get a guy and every time he's gonna end up being a, a lead operator. Some guys are just gonna get to certain levels and that's as far as their career will progress. But this is kind of a, you know, start to finish. So if you can imagine when they come in, they'll be going through, you know, they'll test in and so, no matter what he tests in at, he starts at the level. So at the lowest level, he would start as a C1, but if it's an A operator, he's always gonna start as an A1. So he starts progressing through the different modules, and I'll show you in a second what they, they enlist in, and you can kinda see in the bottom. And then the blue ones, that's kinda some special stuff that we felt like we can't break that up in different modules. We wanna really, really talk about it. So when we're talking about you know, API RP2D cranes, or if we're talking about sims and stuff like that, that's stuff that we have to break out separately and just talk alone about. So that's kind of where that is. The other portion to that one is when, when you get ready to be able to go to a B operator, we need to be able to, you know, have some kind of process in place. So what we're calling it now is like competency verification leads or field verification leads. So that's guys that are in the field that we've identified as senior level guys that really get it. And they're able to go and check this guy that, okay, he can pass the test and we understand that, but we want him to actually simulate it or actually put his hands on it. So maybe he can answer all the right questions to say, yeah, I know how to roll out an orifice plate. We really want to make sure that go physically roll out an orifice plate and, you know, prove you know, pencil to paper and stuff like that. So that's how he would progress through. So it's kind of each one of the milestones before he would go on to the next one. And then that's how we're gonna be able to, to measure exactly where our, you know, our different skill set is between a, a lead, an A, a B, a C. And if you notice, there's, there's no lead on here because I, I hate, somehow our industry a few years back got in the habit of saying there, that there's a, like a real big difference between an A and a lead. In my mind, if you're an A operator, you're a lead operator, you just get paid a little less because you don't have to answer the phones, the email, and you don't have as much responsibility. But if the lead operator leaves, you should be able to step in at any point and be able to handle it. So it kind of ends with an A operator. Now, once you get into A's and the leads, that's where you're gonna get into some of the soft skill stuff. So one of the biggest things I've always said that was the problem with uh, you know, moving up offshore, moving up is I was always progressed and I progressed really quickly because of my technical abilities and, and because of you know school and everything else that, that really pushed me forward. But anytime I got into a supervisor role, nobody ever taught me how to be a supervisor. I never took any kind of soft skill like, hey, this is how you're supposed to properly talk to people. This is how you do teamwork building. So that's 
that's something I really feel like our industry misses. We move up for technical ability, and then all of a sudden we're seeing supervisors failing. And they're not failing because they don't really, really know their job is good. We didn't teach them to be supervisors. So I think that's where you get into it when you get into the A and the leads and stuff like that. So I talked about the, the different ones. So if you can imagine that roadmap, it's, it's just building blocks. So a C operator is your lowest level. A operator is your highest level. So if you look at like equipment and stuff like that, so a separator was at the lowest level, I probably only really need the operator to know what a separator is. And the intermediate, I probably want them to know what's the difference between two and three phase. At, at the senior level, I want them to be able to explain what the inside of that looks like, how the stratification works, you know, how it comes in, it hits the deflectors, how it goes through the agitation plates, why you actually have stratification because of the density of your fluids and your gas and stuff like that. And then, you know, different things, it's, 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 I guess another one would be like if you're talking about gas sales and stuff like that. Well, I want to know at the lowest level, I just want to know that hey, where's the gas sales line? What does that look like? At a B level, I probably want to know that you know how to change out orifice place and stuff like that. The senior level, I'd probably like you to explain to me, you know, what a BTU is and, and how do you define that and what makes, gives a, you know, more energy as opposed to less energy and that's, you know, because of your molecular content and stuff like that. So I guess in the beginning, we're going to kind of put it out there and, and see what sticks and then kind of come out to an EBT uh, basis. And then the other two are the same thing. So same process of going through the lowest level. You talk about it's 14C. Well, we just kind of need you to know what your safety system looks like. You get to the senior level, we really, you're gonna have to be able to tell us how the safe chart is, how you can track it out, how all this stuff actually ties together. And then you might have to look into like ASCII codes and stuff like that in our boiler inspection. <laughs> so I talked to you all about the competency verification leads in the field. This is where these guys come in. So these are, you know, Mark Terrios and stuff like that. And, and then uh, Darren and Doug in the Permian, Mike Allen up north. So what this is, is once these guys get to certain portions, we've got these knowledge and skill assessments that the guys offshore will actually have and they're able to check the box and then there's certain spans. So like a one through, I don't know what it is right now, off the top of my head, but let's say he scores like a, you know, a, a 60. Well, that's telling you he's, he's kind of a 60 to 70, he's a C operator. A 70 to 80, he's a B operator. You know, 80 to 90, he's an A operator. And that's kind of how you break up the skill assessment for the offshore. So what'll happen is eventually, everybody in our company will, will be having these offshore, well, it doesn't matter if we're offshore or not. Every service line will have one developed for their own group. So one of the things that, <laughs> that we really confuse in the U.S. market is we really get training and competency confused or, or blended to, to feel like that's the same. And that's probably one of the bigger mistakes that, that our industry makes. So there's a huge difference between training and competency. And training, you can just think of it that it's a building block to competency. So it's not actual, you're not going to go to this training and, and you're competent. So that, that's where some of our other trainings are going to come in. So we're always going to have a regulatory training. But then we're, we're gonna have some trainings that we just feel like we need to add a little more to it and stuff like that. So that, this is one of them. So when we do new hire, you know, the three day new hire, which we're, we're trying to work on, on getting that a little more easier to go through, but this is kind of the first one. And then you do the, you know, dangers of pressure and stuff like that as your initial. So that's, that's kind of, and, and you'll still have to do rigor and T2 and all the other ones. So these are kind of how they're set up. Uh, I don't know if we can open. So I'm gonna kind of open one to kind of show you how it's progressing through. So, so all it is, you'll have the heaviest part and then you'll blend down. So, so the biggest challenge we're running into right now, especially with the new workforce coming in, is, is how do you present it? So, so you gotta have that proper launch platform because you don't want it to kind of fall on its face and you actually want the guys that are going through it and having to do it feel motivated. So I don't feel like anybody having to sit there and look through 50 PowerPoints with a voiceover from LaRose, Louisiana is going to keep people too motivated. So I want to get more, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. So that's kind of what we're working on right now. So this is kind of, you know, how we would progress through and then it's got your your heaviest content and then we'll strip back to where you'll get to a C operator and that's how we'll, we'll build the different blocks off of. And then the oil 
eleven guys is pretty much the same, and, and, and it just same thing across the, the equipment, mechanical, and safety and regulatory. Uh, so that's what we're doing with the competency offshore. So the, the million dollar thing. So last year we spent one point four million dollars in training. So this year we're tracking around one point one million, but uh, we're, we're we're very polar right now, which is a good thing. So. We're hiring more people, but the cost of training is going down. And that's because we're just doing a few different things to get it right. The more money we can save, then the more we can reinvest into the firm and, and do some cooler things for staff development and stuff like that. And that's kind of the ultimate goal of where we're working right now. <coughs> so we're, we're one of the things that we're doing right now is we're creating the training matrix for each department. So we're kind of all over the place on who's supposed to go where and who's supposed to do what trainings and this and that. The more dialed in we can get, the less headache it is for everybody. If, if you know that, okay, I've got a, a operator that works in the Permian, but I want him to work offshore, you can just switch his job title around and then you can quickly see what he's got, what he's missing, and be able to dial it in from there. So that's kind of what we're working on with the different matrices across the service line. We're just in the training frequencies that match the regulations. So we need to get out of the habit of just throwing training every time an incident happens. That's not the solution. That every time we have an incident or something goes wrong, we say, well, let's let's sit, let's spend more training or let's do more training. And that's, that's not really the solution. So the way that we're looking at, at this now is we're basically gonna match it up with data. So a uh, prime example, Isaac and I went through, uh, talked about it the other day and, and, and made a decision is the Permian, we were doing defensive driving. So we were seeing a rash of motor vehicle incidents before before my time or anything. And so somewhere along the line said, well, we're gonna do defensive driving every year. So fast forward a few years, we're still doing it. We're still having motor vehicle incidents. It's at the same rate. So there's no data to support that, that by changing that to an annual requirement and spending that much more money, does that fix the problem? So. We're not gonna try to you know, solve the solution with training. Sometimes training's the answer. Most of the times you probably need to be a little more uh, eventful on, on coming up with your ideas. So the editing, the job title, sports clarity, the training needs. So, so one thing that's happened is, you know, Dan Austin's got a 71 year history. It's, 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 a, it's a great company, it's a great history. And if, if you look at it from about you know, 2010 to now in the past eight years, I mean, it's, it's just a, a spike trend straight up in the air. So it's just developed at a, at a pretty rapid rate. And so we're trying to just catch up with, with some of the, the time. So because we've expanded so far out into so many more geographical locations, the, the very simple job title doesn't fit everywhere now. So like a, an A operator, well, a deep water A operator, to a shelf A operator, to a land A operator, to a pumper in West Texas, to a pumper in Pennsylvania, they all require different requirements, you know, to be able to work in that geographical location. So all we're trying to do is get a lot more specific on the job title to where, again, you can move your guys around and see, okay, if I want to move him here, what does he need? If I want to move him there, what does he need? And stuff like that. And then we're going to stop spending a lot of money on some of these trainings. So one of the things that's happened in the Permian Basin is we got in the habit of letting the training provider tell us what we needed for training. So if you go ask a training provider what you need for training, well, he's probably gonna tell you everything. So we were doing a, 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 this vast array of training that we probably didn't need to be doing as much of. So we're just getting a little more detailed and then telling our training providers, this is kind of where we, we feel comfortable. And then we're trying to in-house a lot more of that too, where we're coming up with CBTs. One of the focuses right now that I'm looking at is I'm trying to speed up our cycle time. So I'd like to see, you know, I'm, I'm trying to set up a few things to where one, I can measure my cycle time to know how quickly we can get a guy in the door and out the door to training in a safe manner. And and I guess that's taking a little longer than I'd like, but there's a few things that we have to, you know, work through HR and stuff like that. But we're, we're getting there, so. So the, the last part, I guess, and that's the, the biggest thing for, for you guys in the staff development, is by the, the more money that we can save, well, let me step back. So in order for the grant to, to work, is we still have to spend the same money every year. But because you're spending that $1.4 million, don't think of it as $1.4 million out the door, you have your what's called, uh, called your contribution. So it's $1.4 million, 
but you can take all of these hotel rooms that people stay in and you can apply that and that all gets written off of the 1.4 million. You can apply this, this conference room, you get the square footage of it, you go out to market for you know or air, another conference room around here and then you can have a trainer come over here that's more that, that gets taken off the, that 1.4 million that we're gonna have to spend. <laughs> but also what we're able to do with this is we're getting a lot better with developing our staff employees. So a lot of times what our staff feels is kind of they're, they're stagnant and they're not able to you know progress and stuff like that. So that's definitely not what Dan Hoss encourages. You know, that's not how we're gonna meet our vision. So we gotta be able to identify how to properly, you know, get our, our, our staff moving up to that next level and stuff like that. So we're working, Stacy and I are working. I sent out an email, I don't know, six months ago where it was kind of, we wanted everybody to identify some of the trainings that they thought maybe their group needed and the different managers had sent their responses in and stuff like that. So that's kind of where we're at right now is we're working on it to where I feel like that's a good thing from a marketing standpoint as well, as well as developing the employees. Because if, if, if let's say Isaac's group, we put all of the safety specialists in Louisiana through like a cost training where they're certified occupational safety specialists. Well, that looks real good on a marketing blip when you say that all of our safety specialists going in the field have a cost certification. Or, um, you know, like Sam, with, with y'all, like you know, like technical writing abilities and stuff like that, to be able to go through some school that's got some kind of technical ability to be able to write, I guess, more oil field and more technical related. So I think those are all really cool things that could be added in. So I know we're working that process right now. So that is the end of it. In pretty quick time. <laughs> so you got any questions or? What's the, what's the time frame from C1 to C3, how long would it take to? So there's really no time frame because I don't I don't <coughs> want to dictate that if that you're gonna be here in 12 months or you're not gonna be because so Mike you worked in the field as long as I, as well as I did and probably as long as I did so you know that some guys are gonna progress a lot quicker than others so I said it was a five year plan but maybe if you got a really sharp guy it's a three year plan and maybe for some guys it might be a for never plan, our, our 10 year plan, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, 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 you just have to accept it like that, that not everybody's gonna be on the same level and learn at the same space. So I couldn't tell you that, yeah, if he starts here in 12 months, he's gonna be there, so that's. So it would be upon the it, account manager's discretion to say, okay, hey, let's get you this guy to. Yeah, I think it's up to them and to the customer. And, and then, you know, I think that if we look at wanting to set the standard for operational excellence, we have to find individuals that are really motivated for this. So while this is gonna be required, you know, our training is required right now. We still have people that are skipping training and stuff like that. We wanna find people that are really motivated and wanna grow the firm as much as we all sitting in this room wanna grow the firm. So the guys that are participating more and willing to go, then, you know, that, that's, that's kinda how I see that. And, and Mike, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not gonna be designed to where you can just say, all right, well, uh, I got a C operator, he's doing really well. I want to move him up to you know the highest level of C operator. He's not gonna move through the roadmap skipping anything. He's gonna have to go through each uh, section of it before he can pass to the next one. So, so what if what if a customer dictates the time the time frame? Well that's where we're coming. So we're not he's not gonna come out of that. If the customer says calls tomorrow and said, Hey, my, my nephew that I hired six months ago, he, he's an A operator now. We'll put him with that. We'll put him as, as the vice president of that company. But through our module, he's still going to be in that C system and working his way through it, to where we're covered from you know risk point of the Danhall side. So what what it says on the customer side, as opposed to what it's going to say in this system, is well, I mean, we have customers say, "Hey, I want this guy to be at this level this amount of time. How are you guys going to do it? They permitted the challenge. Very recent." I don't think they're looking to bypass these things. They're looking to say, hey. Yeah, how do you close the gap? So I think we're going to be able to measure that, you know, how, basically by taking this and then looking at the statistics of it, we'll be able to say, okay, we don't need to waste all this time with all this other stuff because he really, really gets this, but he really, really doesn't get this. So this is where we need to put our focus on, and that's going to obviously expedite the gap closure to where you're not covering this huge, robust amount of information. You're only covering 
you know, need to know what he did, what he's missing right now. So I think that's probably how we're going to close the gap a lot quicker. What if you're set up to where, let's say, kind of young operator right now, and just see B, can you just take out like the C1, the C2, C3, just pump out the modules one after the other? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now, now the thing, I keep saying that it's a five-year plan, and that's that's kind of how I think that, that operators need to be. The only thing I want to get to that is, like, there's going to be a few things. It's going to be the competency guy in the field. It's going to be the account managers. It's going to be the, the ops managers that are going to agree, and it's going to be the customer that's going to agree on moving up. So the one thing that I don't want to sell to our field staff is that, hey, if you started a C1 and, and you – you go through all these modules, you're going to be an A operator because I don't want them thinking that, oh, well, man, I'll just do this in six months and I'll be making, you know, 30 bucks an hour living the good life. It's not how it's going to work. You know, there's, there's a lot of checks and balances that need to go into it. So, I don't, yeah, you can progress quickly, but it's going to be a digress. You know, there's going to be some, some checks and balances to make sure we're comfortable with it. So, does that answer? Okay, I'll follow along while we with the modules themselves. So the modules, I'd, I'd say we're pretty much done. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable to say that, that we're there. I'm not comfortable to say what that uh, platform looks like yet on how we're gonna launch. So that's kind of what I'm working at right now is I'm looking at you know different uh, software systems or stuff like that to where it's not gonna cost the firm any money because we'll be able to put that through the grant system and then do a few other things a little differently and then speed up cycle times to where we'll be able to use that part of the, the system for the safety stuff, but also for the compliance stuff. And so all of the modular based system that we have will just be kind of front end loaded into that. So I'm, I'm still looking at the, like what that capital model looks like right now. I'm not, so I'm not quite comfortable with the numbers to say this is the business case for it, but before the end of the year, I'm, we'll have definite. So we have senior level operators right now working for us. The plan is for them to go through this competency module, correct? At the end of that, is there an opportunity for them to test R? Right? The only thing they have to do at the end of the year is do yeah, yeah. the assessment. Yeah, if they're already at senior level, uh, what we'll probably do is start them at the, uh, the A3 module, have them go through that, and once they complete that, then it'll be an annual <coughs> KSA uh, basis. So, and then we'll audit that as we go through. I'll go offshore uh, and test this guy annually to make sure that he's still where he needs to be and how he's moving forward. Yeah, we don't want to burden their time or anything, but we definitely need to have something to where we're covering the risk exposure because we don't want to have an incident offshore and then say, well, how did you prove this guy's confident? We want to be able to say, well, here's you know the, the modules that we put him through. This is when he took the test. He, he, he proved mastery level at all of it. And every year we've given him the baseline test and he's still you know proven and stuff like that. And then, hey, look, it's, it's, not, it's not a static system, so it's gonna be dynamic. So th there'll always be opportunities that will you know, be tweaking things, adding things, taking things out, stuff like that, so. Josh, you have one? No, I was just a question. I, 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 I like the idea of having them start out, you know, if they are starting at the A level, but we also want to look at and not every A operator at Chevron or BP or Shell or whoever are made the same. We, I mean, we're going through those battles where, you know, they're at different levels. Uh, when we had the develop program, we needed to kind of let them run through and, and test out all the, you know, from the C level all the way through. So it might be a Good, uh, good idea to have everybody test it from the beginning on out, even though it's a waste, you know, we don't want to waste their time, but we all yeah. want to make sure they Yeah, they're, they're going to they're gonna go through, every person is going to go through it at a leg of the module. They're going to start where their, uh, where their classification is. If he's, a, if he's a senior lead, he's still going to start in the A3 module and go through <coughs> that. Because we have to see that that guy is what he says he is. He can't just tell us he is, and he, we can't take anybody's word for it. We have to see it ourselves. And, and I, got, I guess the other part to that, Josh, is, is I, I've always got to be conscious of the fact that there's, there's financial components tied to all of this. So, I, one, our, our customers aren't paying for us to train our guys. You know, we're requiring that and we're going to make it happen. 
but but the customer is not paying for that and and so we need to make sure that when we're putting the system together and the guys are going through it that you know we're not tying up a ton of time and this and that because that's that's you, you're gonna have costs associated with it so i gotta be pretty conscious about about you know how long some of these things last so it's kind of a big one there david um we saw the blueprint for the competency development on the production side so i think it's a pretty good blueprint just in short if you could give us a preview of coming attractions what does that roadmap look like outside of the production force yeah no. so, so we got it so two-part question our field divisions right mm -hmm. and then lastly the staff itself where you have um, all the different respective areas where the staff yep. the hr finance so, so I, I think it's it's, it's kind of separate so, so the, the the first question on the, the field stuff so a lot of the modules that they'll go through are transparent across the service line. So I don't, I don't care what service line you're at, you're in, everybody needs to know lockout, tag out. And if you're working offshore, everybody needs to know SIMS. Doesn't matter if you're a coder or a construction guy or an operator. So some of those, those modules will just transfer directly over. And then going forward, once we get the system set right, then we're gonna have to go and get with the subject matter experts in different groups and build the different modules. And not everybody's going to be as heavy as, as other ones and stuff. So, so a welder is going to have a lot more specific to his job than you know than a rigger would or something like that. So it's just we're going to set it up a little different. From the the staff development point, you know, I really don't like using words like uh, roadmaps or paths or stuff like that because I don't believe that a, a staff guy. I don't believe their their career is that you know start and stop or, or that straight. It's it's a it's a very dynamic model, so it's kind of all over the place. So if you would have told me a couple of years ago, hey Dave, you're gonna be managing a training department, I probably would have laughed you out the door because I'm an ops guy and that's never where I thought it was gonna be and I'm a project guy. So it's, it's kind of, you drift all over. So there's no set like, hey, this is your roadmap for a safety specialist and if you do all this, this is gonna move you into, I don't know, project management and this and that. It's kind of, you might go drift off and be a project manager for a little while and then Hey, maybe you're managing the training department for a little while, and, and it's kind of you know dynamic in it. So I'd hate to say that you're going to see a roadmap for every one of the staff divisions and, and departments. And does that, does that make sense? So, anybody got anything else? service line to, to at some point. It's just, we started with operators because at the end of the day, Mark and I are you know, a couple of dirt ball operators. So start with what we know first and then we'll work our way from there. So we started off with this one. This was kind of the R&D to map out what the program needs to look like, how long it needs to be, how, it's gonna, how we're gonna be able to track it and measure it and stuff like that. That's one of the other challenges I'm running into now is, is, is being able to properly manage the statistics because you got to think about it that if you've got somebody just inputting data well that, that's another resource so we can't have just tying up people doing that so there has to be some way that the, the relationships are communicating through a software system so we're kind of working through all that right now so did you say dirt bike what is that did you say dirt bike <laughs> dirt ball dirt ball <laughs> 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 